why um, okay. yeah you can start yeah it works okay so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, michael albanese that he will give the the fourth lecture about the yamabe invariant of complex structure uh, surfaces sorry okay. complex structure in my <laughs> complex surfaces okay please Thank thanks anna um so yeah, I think this is the final lecture of the summer school. So I just wanted to thank the organizers for organizing this event um, and for inviting me in particular. So really appreciate it. Um, hopefully soon we'll be able to do these things in person. Uh, I think we're all looking forward to that. Okay, so let me just recap what we did last time on Wednesday. So, well, let me go back to the beginning. What was the goal of this series of lectures was to answer the question, what is the relationship between the Yamabe invariant and the Kadaira dimension for compact complex surfaces? So the Yamabe invariant was an invariant for any smooth manifold coming from Romanian geometry. The Kadaira dimension is an invariant coming from complex geometry. So a priori, these two things may be completely unrelated. But we saw for Riemann surfaces, we could calculate both of these things quite easily. So on the one hand, the Yamabe invariant was kind of easily to compute easily computed using gauss bonnet theorem, and Kadaira dimension kind of followed from standard facts, kind of Riemann rock type calculations. You could also calculate the Kadaira dimension of Riemann surfaces. And we saw that there's this trichotomy between Kadaira dimension minus infinity, zero, one, and Yamabe invariant positive zero and negative respectively. And this fits well with other trichotomies in that dimension, namely the uniformization theorem. So universal cover being CP1, C or the upper half plane. Okay, so that hinted that there may be some kind of relationship beyond dimension one, but also kind of there's a level of skepticism because there's a lot of things that are true in complex dimension one or real dimension two that don't generalize. It's just a lot more can change and there's more variability in higher dimensions. So it's somewhat surprising that Lebrun's theorem is true. So Lebrun's theorem says, if X is a connected compact Taylor got a word here, surface, then we have this relationship between the Kadara dimension and Yamabe invariant, which is similar to what we see in complex dimension one. In the minimal Kadara dimension, the Yamabe invariant is positive. In the maximal Kadara dimension, Yamabe invariant is negative, and everywhere in between the Yamabe invariant is zero. And we also discussed last time that this doesn't generalize to higher dimensions. Okay, so this is about the best you can do. You can go from dimension one to dimension two, but you need to assume Kähler. Okay, so in complex dimension one, everything is Kähler. So this seems like a natural assumption to make, but in complex dimension two, there are non Kähler surfaces. So the question we're gonna deal with today is, do there, you know, does this relationship persist if we remove the Kähler hypothesis? Is it true for non Kähler surfaces? Okay, and before I say that, I just want to address a question that Mustafa asked at the end of last lecture. I said at the end of the last lecture that the Kadara dimension is a diffeomorphism invariant for Kähler surfaces. That's a theorem of cyborg witten theory. So that's true. And Mustafa said, isn't that also true for non-Kähler surfaces? Uh, and the answer is yes, but you don't need cyborg witten theory. Uh, that follows from kind of topological considerations, many of which are going to come up today. So actually something is as coarse as the first virtual Betty number um, distinguishes between the Kadara dimensions. And in fact, in the non kähler case, it's a homotopy invariant, not just a diffeomorphism invariant. Okay. So with that out, of, that out of the way, let's go on to the Yamabe invariant of non kähler surfaces. So here there are two references. Uh, the first one is a paper that came out of my thesis. So I think it was published this year. Um, my thesis was two, from 2019, so somewhere in between those two years. And uh, a recent paper that came out a month or two ago between myself and Paul Lebrun uh, called Kadara Dimension and the Yamabe Problem 2, which is seen as a sequel to Lebrun's original paper. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is look at the Yamabe invariant of non kähler surfaces and see, do we have the same relationship that we see in the Kähler case? So what we're going to do is proceed uh, individually. So look at Kadara dimension minus infinity, then zero, then one, and see what we can say in each of those cases. So remember, in the non kähler case, there are no examples with Kadara dimension two. Kadara dimension two implies Kähler. Right. 
So let's start with Kadara dimension minus infinity. Okay, so these are class seven surfaces. So the first example of a class seven surface is also the first example of a non kahlo surface that you may have seen. And these are known as Hopf surfaces. Okay, so Hopf gave the first example of complex manifolds which don't admit Kähler metrics in any dimension, at least two, but in particular in dimension two. So they are, um, so Hopf surfaces are complex surfaces with universal cover C2 minus the origin. Okay, so an example, a standard example is you take uh, C2 minus the origin modulo in action of the integers generated by C goes to two times Z. So the, so let me call this X. Then you have pi one of X is isomorphic to Z. And in fact, X is diffeomorphic to S1 cross S3. Okay, so that's an example. So this can't be Kähler because the first Betty number of this surface is one, but as we've seen, the odd Betty numbers of compact Kähler manifolds are even. <clears throat> so we call a hop surface primary if pi one is isomorphic to Z and secondary otherwise. So two facts, uh, every primary hop surface is diffeomorphic to S1 plus S3. So just like we saw in the previous example and every secondary hop surface is finitely covered. by a primary hop surface. Okay, so the, the first fact follows from the um, observation that all hop surfaces exist in a complex family. So you can deform any hop surface to any other. So in particular, their smooth structure is the same. <clears throat> right, so in the first case, these primary hop surfaces, they're all diffeomorphic to S1 cross S3. So if I want to compute the Yamabe invariant, or well, I'm just looking at the Yamabe invariant of S1 cross S3, but that clearly has a positive scalar curvature metric. Just take DT squared plus a, the round metric on S3, right? So this will definitely have a positive scalar curvature metric and hence the Yamabe invariant will be positive. So note that your Marbian variant of S1 cross S3 is positive. That's kind of obvious. What about these secondary hop surfaces? So there are two types. Two, um, well, not two types. Yeah, two types. So one is that it's diffeomorphic to S1 cross a quotient of S3. Where H is a finite group acting freely. And two, is that it's a mapping torus 
of a quotient of S3 by a diffeomorphism. of order two or three. Okay, so what, what do I mean by mapping torus here? I mean, you take your, in this case, three manifold, cross it with the interval zero to one, and then you identify the endpoints. So you take a point in the zero slice and identify it with the image of the diffeomorphism. So the diffeomorphism gives you another point in here in the one slice. Okay, so you take this cross zero one and you identify the two ends together via the diffeomorphism. Okay, and in this case, the diffeomorphism is of order two or three, meaning that F composed with F is the identity or F composed with F composed with F is the identity. In particular, if you take a double or triple cover of anything in this family, you're in this case, okay? So, Manifolds in the first type have PSC metrics. Okay, so it's not obvious because it would depend on the finite group. So if it's a cyclic group and you get like a lens space, then you can see that, well, lens spaces have positive scalar curvature because the round metric on S3 descends because the group action is acting by isometries. But in general, you would need to know does H act by isometries so of, a, of the round metric, say, so that the round metric descends? If it doesn't act by isometries, then you don't necessarily get a metric that descends. But it's a theorem, kind of a corollary of the geometrization theorem proved by Perelman, is that no matter which finite group action you have, so if you have a finite group acting freely on the three sphere, then it's conjugate to an action by isometries of the round metric. And hence the round metric descends to that quotient. In particular, this will always have positive scalar curvature metrics and hence have positive Yamabe invariant. What's less clear is what happens in the second type. Okay, so we know that if I have a manifold of this form and I take a double or triple cover, it'll be of this form and that cover has positive scalar curvature. But it's not always the case that if you have some cover with positive scalar curvature, then your manifold has positive scalar curvature. Okay, so it does not immediately follow that manifolds. The second type have PSC metrics. So, in general, if you have a covering, with the covering space admitting PSC metrics, Um, the base does not necessarily have PSC metrics. <clears throat> so it's not obvious that the Yamabe invariant here is positive. But in, a, in an upcoming paper, which I was hoping to finish before these lectures, but that didn't happen. Uh, I show manifolds in the second type of the second type do have PSC metrics. So in particular, 
all the secondary hop surfaces have positive Yamabe invariant. Okay, so all of these hop surfaces have positive Yamabe invariant. And then by the surgery result, of Bromov and Lawson, uh, blow up of hop surfaces also have positive Yamabe invariant. So remember the what do I mean by this surgery result of Gromov and Lawson? It just implies that if you have two manifolds of dimension at least three, which these are, and they each individually have positive scalar curvature, then you can build a positive scalar curve, positive scalar curvature metric on the connected sum. So in this case, we have our hop surface. We know they all have positive scalar curvature now, and we have CP2 bar or several copies of CP2 bar, and those each individually have positive scalar curvature. So put them together via connect sum, they still have positive scalar curvature and hence have positive Yamabe invariant. So this matches what we see in the Kähler case, right? So in the Kähler case, if your Kodaira dimension minus infinity, you have positive Yamabe invariant. What we've now got is some new examples of Kodaira dimension minus infinity surfaces, but in the non kähler case, these hop surfaces and all of them and their blow ups have positive Yamabe invariant. So that fits the pattern that LeBrun's theorem dictates. Okay, so this gives us some hope that maybe this is this theorem is going to extend. Okay, so that's one class. So you know, if you remember back to the classification, the Kodaira and Riquez classification, kind of in the in the box, Kodaira dimension minus infinity b one odd. I just put class seven surfaces. And at the time I said, there's no greater explanation than what class seven surfaces are other than they're the things that sit inside of that box. There's no intrinsic calculate, uh, characterization. So in particular, they're not all hop surfaces because otherwise I would have just written hop surfaces. So what else is in there? So there is another construction. of class seven surfaces. Due to in a way. So they are quotients of C cross the upper half plane by a group of affine transformations. So there are four families of such manifolds. So there's S capital M plus, S capital M minus, S N plus P Q R T, and S N minus P Q R. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the definition because the basically all of this data here, you know, the exponent and the subscripts is related to how you define the affine transformations. And so it's somewhat complicated. I mean, when you first see it, it looks very complicated, but when you kind of play around with it for a while, it starts to make a little bit more sense. So here M is a three by three integer matrix uh, with certain properties of its eigenvalues. And N here is a two by two integer matrix with certain properties of its eigenvalues. And then P, Q, R, T are numbers that you pick and that satisfy certain conditions. Okay, so let me say the first two are 
diffeomorphic. Okay, so what do I mean by this? I mean, if you pick a, an appropriate three by three matrix, which appropriate means there's no, there's one real positive eigenvalue, which is not one uh, or minus one. So, right, so there's an appropriate matrix you pick. Um, so given that matrix, you can construct two different complex surfaces, the plus version and the minus version, but those two surfaces are diffeomorphic, but the complex structure is different. Diffeomorphic, and moreover, you know something about diffeomorphism type, it's diffeomorphic to the mapping torus of a three torus. So you take a three-dimensional torus, cross it with the interval zero one, then you glue the two ends together via a diffeomorphism. Okay, so this three by three integer matrix defines for you, you can think of it as a linear map on R3, which preserves the integer sublattice and hence descends to a diffeomorphism of the torus. That's the mapping torus diffeomorphism that you're taking. Rather that of the transpose of the matrix. Okay, so that's in the first case. The second case is slightly more complicated, but it is related. And the final two are diffeomorphic to the mapping torus of a non trivial. Circle bundle over T two. Okay, so in this, in these last two families, you still get a mapping torus, but instead of the fiber being a three torus, it's a circle bund, a non-trivial circle bundle over T two. So the three torus is a trivial circle bundle over T two, and here we have the non-trivial circle bundles. <clears throat> so in both cases. The diffeomorphism that we use to construct the mapping tor torus the diffeomorphism is induced by a linear map on R three. So it's not a very uh, weird diffeomorphism, it's just you have a linear map on R3 and it descends to either the three torus or this non-trivial circle bundle over T2 to be a diffeomorphism there. So it's a pretty simple diffeomorphism that you can kind of construct using, in the first case, the matrix M or in these latter cases, these quantities. Okay, so the diffeomorphism type, we have some sort of explicit description of, so we could hope to use this to calculate the Yamabe invariant. So if Lebrun's theorem is true, the Yamabe invariant of these manifolds should be positive. Lebrun's theorem kind of translates to the non kähler case. So that was the focus of my thesis. Theorem. So this is in that paper I mentioned at the beginning. It's published in 21, but uh, you can find it in my thesis from 2019. So inner way surfaces, by which I mean any of these all of these so in way surfaces and their blow ups have the Marby invariant zero. So corollary. The Kähler hypothesis LeBrun's theorem is necessary. So you really needed the Kähler hypothesis um, for the Brun's theorem. So that was clear from the proof. 
different. There were several steps in the proof which required Kayla, so namely use the Kadar Enriquez classification uh, in the Kayla case, so the first column of that table. You also use cyber witten theory based on the fact that these, surface, these uh, manifolds were symplectic, to symplectic form coming from the Kayla metric. Okay, so the proof certainly didn't translate, but this shows that even the, the conclusion doesn't translate, that it is not the case that if you have Kadar dimension minus infinity, you always have positive Yamabi invariant. These inner way surfaces have Yamabi invariant zero. Okay, so this is somewhat surprising. So let me say a few words about proof. I'm not going to say the full proof now. Um, so I'll just point out, recall that Lebrun. that elliptic surfaces collapse with bounded scalar curvature. Right, so this means there's a sequence of metrics whose volume goes to zero, but the scalar curvature is uniformly bounded. So if you plug that into the Einstein-Hilbert functional, you get a sequence of values going to zero and it follows with a little bit of thought that if you have collapsing with bounded scalar curvature, you have non-negative Yamabe invariant. Right, so these inner way surfaces so remember what an elliptic surface is maybe just remind you an elliptic surface is a surface which maps to a Riemann surface or a curve such that almost every fiber is an elliptic curve so a, a genus one Riemann surface okay there, there can be finitely many fibers where the fiber may be singular or a multiple of a uh, smooth fiber um, in the sense of like the divisor, but generically the fibers are smooth genus one curves. Okay, so if you want to prove the Yamabe invariant of something is zero, one way to do it is show it's at least it's greater than or equal to zero and it's less than or equal to zero. So you might hope, well, if I can use this trick of Lebrun, right? So elliptic surfaces have non negative Yamabe invariant. So the question is, are inner way surfaces elliptic surfaces? If so, I can just use that fact. Um, however, inner way surfaces do not contain any uh, complex curves. So in particular, they are not elliptic. Elliptic surface contains lots and lots of elliptic curves, the fibers of the map, at least most of the fibers of the map, whereas inner way surfaces have no curves whatsoever. No smooth curves at least. However, one can still show they collapse with bounded scalar curvature. And so they still have the same conclusion, they collapse with bounded scalar curvature, but not because they're elliptic for some other reason. So, so one way to show this is to show that they admit what's known as a T structure, which is a special case of a idea called an F structure due to Chiga, Chiga and uh, Gromov. But in the interests of time, I will leave it at that. So a T structure, kind of morally, what is it? You split up your manifold into a collection of finitely many open sets. On each of those open sets, you have a torus acting uh, locally freely. The torus can be a different dimension depending on which open set. And on intersections, 
of those open sets, you have to have some compatibility condition between the tori acting. So the, the intersections have to be preserved by all the torus actions and the torus actions have to commute. So if you do one and then the other, that's the same as if you did them in the reverse order. That's what the T structure is. Okay, so in particular, if you look at say, the first two types of inner way surfaces, they're mapping tori of tori, you split that surface into two open sets and at the pre-image of, you know, split S1 into two open sets. And so let's say S1 minus one and S1 minus minus one, those two open sets, look at the pre-image under the projection map, you get two open sets, which just look like a torus cross an open interval. Okay, so those have three torus actions where you just move the torus by translations. And then because the diffeomorphism is induced by a linear map, those, uh, those actions actually commute on overlaps. Okay, so in particular, the first type of inner way surfaces, it's easy to see that they have T structures, just kind of, if you do what the natural thing would be to do once you know the definition. You can also show the other two families have torus actions there. It's a little bit more complicated because the fibers aren't tori anymore. So the, this, the way you split up into open sets is a little bit different, but nonetheless, you can show that they admit T structures. So for example, this is due to, and Petian. Uh, they showed this, I think, in 06. And these T structures imply collapse with bounded scalar curvature. So we see that all. In a way, surfaces have non negative Yamabi invariant. Okay, so what about what happens when you blow up, right? So I've just talked about these surfaces, but you could blow up, maybe something changes. Well, there's a theorem of Kobayashi, which is kind of related to the um, Grom of Lawson surgery result. So there, the Grom of Lawson surgery result, we use that to say when we have a manifold with positive scalar curvature and we blow it up, then it still has positive scalar curvature. Okay, Kobayashi slightly generalizes this where instead of the Yamabe invariant being positive, it's greater than or equal to zero. So the result of Kobayashi says that if you have two manifolds of the same dimension, which is at least three, and the Yamabe invariant of each of them is not negative, then the Yamabe invariant of the connect sum is not negative. Okay, so if you remove the non negative to just be positive, this would follow from the surgery result of Bremer for Lawson. Okay, so in particular, we have in a way surfaces have non negative Yamabe invariant, and we also have CP2, which has positive Yamabe invariant in between in particular non-negative. So the connected sum will be non-negative. So this implies blow-ups, way surfaces also have non-negative. So all we have to do to show that it has Yamabe invariant zero is to rule out positive scalar curvature metrics. And so we'll come back to this. Bit later. Okay, but the key to this uh, construction is to say the key to this theorem is to show that these surfaces cannot admit positive scalar curvature metrics. <clears throat> All right, so we, we kind of a little bit deflated maybe that the Bruns theorem doesn't hold in the non-Kähler case. We found one counterexample and therefore it's not true. 
but you can ask yourself, well, okay, we had two examples, we had two families of examples. We had the hop surfaces, and it was kind of it was consistent with what we saw in the Kayla case. Then we had the inway surfaces, which was not consistent. It's not positive Yamabian variant, we get something different. So what we can do is just say, well, what else is there in the non-Kayla case? Right? We still have the Kadar and Riquez classification. Maybe we can just calculate the other Yamabian variants and see is it that in a way surfaces are somewhat special, that they're really the only counterexample, that it's just kind of a freak accident, or is it kind of typical that kind of this relationship breaks down completely? There's lots of different counterexamples. So what we're going to do is proceed and just say, well, what else can we say about the non kaler case? Can we calculate the Imabi invariance of the other non kaler surfaces? So in particular, what else is there in class seven? So we've had hop surfaces and inner way surfaces in class seven, but what else is there? Maybe those ones have positive Imabi variance, or maybe they have zero like inner way. Or possibly even negative. So first is a theorem, kind of an amalgamation of several people's works, starting with Bogomolov and Li, Ya, Zheng, and finally Telemann. So if X is a class seven surface, with B2 equal to zero, with X equal to zero, then X is a hot surface or in a way surface. So we know that hop surfaces are either S1 cross S3 or a quotient thereof. So it follows that B2 is zero. Maybe, and it's not obvious that no way surfaces have B2 zero. Okay, so a mapping torus of a three torus could have B2 equal to zero, but also could have positive B2. For example, if you take the trivial mapping torus of the three torus, you get the four torus, which has non-zero B2. So it will depend on what the diffeomorphism does. Okay, so you can check that things are set up, you kind of make the choices you make and it implies that B2 is actually zero in all of those cases, all those four families. What this theorem shows is that the two examples we've considered so far, they're the only ones with B2 equals zero. You have to have B2 positive if you want to look at other examples. Right, so obviously if you blow up, then B2 changes. You get, each time you blow up, you increase by one because you connect some with CP2 bar. Okay, so you have blow ups of these things, but you might ask, aside from blow ups of these things, are there other class seven surfaces? Okay, so are there minimal class seven surfaces other than hot and in a way? So this is related to a famous, well, a still open conjecture in this area. So let me tell you about it. So a global spherical shell. in a complex surface is an open subset U by holomorphic to a neighborhood of S3 inside of C2 minus the origin. So all complex surfaces have this because you can just take an open ball in a chart and then remove a point. But you also need the complement of this open set U to be connected. Okay, so that's what a global spherical shell is. <clears throat> so it's this spherical shell, this neighborhood of S3, such the complement is uh, K 
connected. That's what makes it global. Right, so an example of this is if you think about a primary hop surface is diffeomorphic to S1 cross S3, then just pick a point in the S1, get a copy of S3, take a neighborhood of the point in S1, you get a little interval across the S3, that's a global spherical shell. Okay. If, you take a, if you remove an S3 from the S1 cross S3, what remains is connected. So these things have global spherical shells. Also, if you blow up a bunch of points, you just pick an S3, which doesn't contain any of those points. And so blow ups of primary pop surfaces have global spherical shells. <clears throat> That's kind of one way you can think about motivating these things. So Cato showed, so Cato introduced this notion and he showed that if X admits a global spherical shell. X is a degeneration of blown up primary hop surfaces. That is, we have a complex family, we call it. X over an open disk, such that X over zero is equal to X and XT is a blown up primary hot surface for T not equal to zero. Okay, so as I mentioned, blow-ups of primary hot surfaces have a global spherical shells. Carto showed that if you have a global spherical shell, you have to be a deformation of one of these things. Okay, so essentially up to deformation, they're the only examples. So these blown up primary hop surfaces are not minimal, but this thing that it degenerates to may be minimal. Okay, so it's not just another primary hop surface. It could be something actually different, something that's not biholomorphic to a blown up primary hop surface. However, they are diffeomorphic. Okay, so if you have a, uh, two complex manifolds, which are deformation equivalent, they are necessarily diffeomorphic. So this, in the complex category, these fibers can be different, but in the smooth category, they actually have to be diffeomorphic. This is Erisman's lemma. So in terms of computing the Yamabe invariant, if you have a global spherical shell, then you're diffeomorphic to a blown up hop surface, which has positive scalar curvature. So you have positive Yamabe invariant. So what's the global spherical shell conjecture? This is conjecture. This is due to Nakamura. In 89. It's rather speculative, but let X be a class seven surface with B2 of X positive. Okay, so we saw with B2 of X equal to zero, they're either hot for inner way. So we're kind of outside of that realm now. So the conjecture is that if you have such a surface, then X has a global spherical shell. So essentially you get no new diffeomorphism types at least. And so you get some more complex manifolds, but they'll be diffeomorphic too blown up primary hop surfaces. So in particular, when it comes to computing the Yamabe invariant, there'll be nothing left to do. We'll have, we have all the information we need in terms of it's positive because it's the same as the case we examined earlier. So if the conjecture is false, which we don't know yet, still open, then we know nothing about the diffeomorphism type really. Using the structure of kind of the Kadar and Riquez classification, you can show that a class seven surface has B1 equal to one. But beyond that, we don't really know anything about 
the diffeomorphism or even homotopy type of these manifolds if there is a counterexample. So we don't know if the fundamental group has to be Z or has a finite subgroup, finite index subgroup isomorphic to Z, that's still not known. Um, so basically, if this conjecture is true, we're done. If it's not true, we have so much to do because we know nothing about these surfaces. So kind of, if you have a, a surface with class seven surface, B2 positive without global spherical shell, it's diffeomorphism type could be quite strange and it's unclear what to expect. We just know so little about it. But if we assume the conjecture, then we've kind of dealt with everything in class seven. Okay. So that's Kadara dimension minus infinity. What happens in the other Kadara dimensions? So Kadara dimension zero in the non-Kaler case, we have uh, primary and secondary Kadara surfaces. So let me point out that primary Kadira surfaces have trivial canonical bundle. So this is, for example, proved in Bath, Kulik, Peters, Van der Ven. So let me point out that this implies that X is symplectic. So how does this work? Let alpha be a nowhere zero section of Kx. Okay, so remember what is Kx? It's the top exterior power of the cotangent bundle. So this would be wedge two of T star of X. So alpha is a holomorphic to zero form. And it's just nowhere zero. So at every point, it's non zero. This exists because this bundle is trivial. Then you can take omega, your symplectic form, to be the real part of alpha, which is one half of alpha plus its conjugate. Okay, so you can show that that's a symplectic form. It's closed and it is non degenerate. <clears throat> So this, this implication that the canonical bundle is trivial implies the manifold is symplectic. This is special to complex dimension two. Okay, so canonical bundle does not imply symplectic in general. So e.g. there are these non kähler Calabia. Uh, manifolds, diffeomorphic to a connected sum of copies of S3 cross S3, if K is at least two. Those things can't be symplectic because the symplectic form gives you a non-zero class in degree two cohomology, but these manifolds have degree two cohomology that's zero. Okay, so this is special to complex dimension two. And if you think about what happens in Kadara dimension zero in the Kala case, you have tori and uh, K3 surfaces and quotients of those. So tori and K3 surfaces have trivial canonical bundle. You can get symplectic forms that way as well. Okay. So this symplectic uh, feature is very useful because we saw in the proof of Lebrun's theorem, uh, we use cyborg witten theory and part of that that toolbox that we needed to get cyber witten theory going was a symplectic form, right? So a symplectic form gave us what's called a non-trivial cyber witten variant, and that gave us information about positive scalar curvature. So the fact that we, even though we're not Kähler, even though primary primary Kadira surfaces aren't Kähler, we still get a symplectic form anyway. So we can still use the same technique. So remember, you need a symplectic form to give you a non-trivial cyber witten invariant. And then B plus was the issue. So B plus bigger than one, somehow it followed immediately. B plus equal to one, it was, it was uh, dependent on the structure. So B plus equal to one, non-trivial cyber witten variant. There are examples where there are positive scalar curvature. So um, rational and rule surfaces. And there are examples where there are not, okay? So the next key is we have a symplectic form. If B plus is bigger than one, 
we can immediately use Seibig-Witten theory to rule out positive scalar curvature. So on a non kähler surface, you can calculate B plus in terms of the Hodge numbers as follows. Okay. This fact is also proved in Bath Collect Peters van der Ven. So in the Kähler case, you'd have a plus one here, and that would correspond to the Kähler form. In non kähler case, you just get two times H20. And remember what H20 is, it's the dimension of H0 of x kx, which is two times the dimension of the space of sections of the canonical bundle, holomorphic sections, but the canonical bundle is trivial. So we just guess two times the dimension of holomorphic functions on x, but x is compact. So this is two times the dimension of c, which is two, okay. which in particular is bigger than one. So symplectic and B plus bigger than one implies no PSC by Sadler Witten theory. So even though it's non kähler basically the same proof in the Kähler case works here because we have a symplectic form for some other reason. So these primary Kodaira surfaces are interesting because they are complex and symplectic, but those two structures are not compatible because that would give you Kähler. Okay, but it's somehow symplectic for a different reason than the Kähler reason. <clears throat> so there's no positive scalar curvature and also so that tells you the Yamabe invariant is less than or equal to zero. Primary Kodaira surfaces are all elliptic. Actually, before I say that, I should also mention the blow ups. So what happens if you blow up? Let me just say briefly, using symplectic blow up. So there's a notion of blow up of complex surface that we talked about on Tuesday, I believe. There's also a notion of blowing up a point in a symplectic manifold. And those two constructions, the point is that you can do this blow up and then you either have a complex or symplectic structure on the thing you blow up and then a map which uh, has certain properties. So in particular, you can blow up a symplectic manifold at a point and it still has a symplectic structure. So you might say, well, if I view this primary Kodaira surface as a complex manifold and I blow it up, is that different than if I blew it as this, view it as a symplectic manifold and blow it up? And the answer is no, they're diffeomorphic. So the complex blow up is diffeomorphic to the symplectic blow up. In particular, the complex blow up has symplectic form. So you can still run the same argument. So the same argument applies to uh, blow-ups of primary Kodaira surfaces. And so you can argue that the blow-ups of primary Kodaira surfaces thought of as complex manifolds, they're diffeomorphic to the blow-ups as symplectic manifolds, and there, there is a symplectic form. So you still have a symplectic form, you still have B plus bigger than one. So the same argument rules out positive scalar curvature. Okay. So we see that primary Kodaira surfaces in their blow-ups don't have positive scalar curvature. What about secondary? Well, the secondary ones are just covered by such things. So if they had positive scalar curvature, you pull it back to the cover, the cover would have positive scalar curvature, but we just ruled that out. So. Secondary Kodaira services and their blow ups are finitely covered by 
primary cadaver surfaces and their blow ups. They also have a Marby invariant less than equal to zero. So if you know that you have a manifold that doesn't have positive scalar curvature, then any quotient of it doesn't have positive scalar curvature. So remember in the Kähler case, Kadar dimension zero meant you might be invariant zero. What we've shown so far is the Yamabi invariant is zero or negative. So, so far it's consistent. But now note that uh, Kadara surfaces, both primary and secondary, are elliptic. So, this implies that the Yamabi invariant x is greater than or equal to zero. Where X is a Kadira surface or a blow up thereof. So LeBrun proved that elliptic surfaces have non negative Yamaha invariant. <clears throat> so, in particular, Kadira surfaces and their blow ups have non negative Yamaha invariant. So, combining these two. Our dimension x equal to zero implies the Marby invariant is zero as well. So this is what we see in the Kähler case, and it's what we see in the non-Kähler case. So at least, you know, in a way surfaces were this counterexample, but we've yet to find another one. So Hopf surfaces was consistent. If the global spherical shell conjecture is true, all of those surfaces are consistent. Kadara dimension zero. So these primary and secondary Kadara surfaces, they're all consistent Yamabi invariant. So all that's left to consider is Yamabi, uh, Kadara dimension one. <clears throat> so these are the properly, uh, sorry, non kähler properly elliptic uh, surfaces. So this was the, this was the topic that we focused on in this paper between myself and LeBrun, which was put on the archive a month or two ago. Okay, so non kähler properly elliptic surfaces and their blow ups have your Marby invariant zero. Okay. So everything in the non kähler properly elliptic surfaces, so everything here, non kähler case, has your Marby invariant zero, which matches the kähler case. So your Marby. Uh, Kadara dimension one in the Kähler case was your Marby invariant zero, likewise in the non Kähler case. Okay. So we already know because they're elliptic, LeBrun showed that the Yamabi invariant is non negative. So just need to rule out the existence of positive scalar curvature metrics. And then we would conclude that your Marby invariant is zero. So how do we rule out uh, positive scalar curvature? In the case of Kadara surfaces, we used a symplectic form, right? So it's not Kähler, but somehow there was still a symplectic form. So you might hope, oh, maybe these surfaces or some of them are symplectic. Turns out that's not the case. So uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, 
non kayla properly elliptic surfaces are never symplectic. Since this is due to Picard in 98. <clears throat> so this uses cyborg Witten theory. So if you have a symplectic form that has implications about cyborg Witten invariance, so what he does is he analyzes the cyborg Witten invariance for these surfaces and realizes they can't be consistent with the symplectic hypothesis. Okay, so that, that approach doesn't work here. You have to use something else. <clears throat> so what we do is we kind of, we lean on the fact that they are elliptic and try and get some information about the diffeomorphism type of these manifolds using this elliptic structure. So I haven't spoken too much about the elliptic kind of what's known about elliptic surfaces, but there's a lot known. This goes back to Kadaira. So remember elliptic surface is a map is a surface which admits a map to a curve such that almost every fiber is a smooth elliptic curve, so a genus one Riemann surface. And there's finitely many fibers which may not be that. So they could be singular in some sense, or singular degree one curve, uh, genus singular curve, so dimension one. So they're not necessarily smooth submanifolds, but they're you know, sub varieties. And Kadara classified the potential uh, sub varieties that can arise. Another possibility is that they're multiple. So there's kind of, you think of the pre-image of a point under this map as a divisor inside of this uh, complex surface. And that divisor may not be uh, primitive. That is, it's a multiple of something else. So that's called a multiple fiber. So what we do is we look at this structure and we kind of see what is the structure we can get out of this? What is the diffeomorphism type of these surfaces using this information about elliptic surfaces? Okay, so what we do is we prove the following theorem, which will then apply to these surfaces. So let me state the theorem. And this theorem will also allow us to show that inner way surfaces don't have positive scalar curvature. So remember, when I said the in a way surfaces have your Marvian variant zero, I said we'll come back to positive scalar curvature later. This theorem deals with that case as well as non kähler properly elliptic. So again, compact, closed, closed, orientable, connected, three manifold. And let X be a mapping torus. Right, so in the inner way surface case, inner way surfaces are all mapping tori of either a three torus or a non trivial circle bundle over a two torus. So that would be your N, and X would be your inner way surface. But this is a more general statement, but in particular, it would apply to that case. Let P be any uh, connected, smooth, closed, orientable, four manifold, <clears throat> and let M be the connected sum of this X with P. So for us, P is going to be some copies of CP2 bar. Okay, so this would be kind of the result of blowing up. So what we show is that if the Yamabi invariant of this three manifold is non-negative, then the Yamabi invariant of this manifold M, sorry, the Yamabi invariant is non-positive of N, the same is true of M. So I, in terms of positive scalar curvature, if N does not admit ASC metrics, 
then neither does M. So we've kind of knocked the problem down by one dimension. You have this four manifold you've constructed and you want to know, does it have positive scalar curvature? So I can see the Yamabe invariant is positive. And we've reduced that to saying, well, all you have to do is look at the, this manifold N you started with to construct this four manifold. If that three manifold has positive scalar curvature, uh, if this three manifold doesn't, then your original manifold doesn't. Okay, so in this case of inner, inner way surfaces, N would be a three torus or a non-trivial circle bundle. So the question is, do either of those have positive scalar curvature? If not, then neither do inner way surfaces. And by this, letting this P be CP2 bars, neither do their blocks. So, so what about, what is known about three manifolds and which ones have positive scalar curvature? So actually in the orientable case, we know exactly which ones do and don't. So closed orientable three manifold as PSC metrics if and only if it contains no aspherical factors in its prime decomposition. Okay, so the prime decomposition of a three manifold, it's a theorem that says, if you take any closed orientable three manifold, you can write it as a connected sum in an essentially unique way up to order of the factors where each of the connect sum ends can no longer be split into a connected sum. And so it's the analog of the fact that every integer can be written as a product of primes in a unique way, right? product of numbers which can't be split up again. Right? So here you're writing it as a connect sum of manifolds which can't be split up again. Right? So if you look at all of the terms in the connected sum, right? so maybe you have lots of different pieces, if none of those pieces are aspherical, which means has contractible universal cover, then it will have positive scalar curvature. As soon as you have at least one of those factors in your decomposition, you fail to have positive scalar curvature. So in particular, T3 and non-trivial circle bundles over T2, do not admit PSC metrics. Because there the universal cover is R3, which is contractible. So the theorem therefore implies In a way, surfaces and their blow ups do not admit PSC metrics. And so the fact that T3 and circle bundles over T2, that's our N, they don't have positive scalar curvature, so the Yamabe invariant is not a positive, so it follows that the the four manifold doesn't have positive scalar curvature either. Okay, so this theorem encapsulates the inner way surface case, but it also works for the properly non elliptic. And it also does Kodaira, uh, Kodaira dimension zero, the Kodaira surfaces. So actually, it treats all of them. This theorem captures all of them. It shows that none of them have positive scalar curvature. So this theorem was initially approved with some more restrictive hypothesis in my thesis. So in my thesis, I had to assume that B1 of X was one, which is the case for inner way surfaces. Um, and I had to assume that P was simply connected. Okay. So by modifying that argument slightly, we saw that those restrictions aren't necessary. And in particular, they can be used more generally in particular for these other cases. All right, so two things I wanna say is give a brief 
uh, indication of how do you prove this theorem? And secondly, and most importantly, how does this theorem help us with properly non elliptic? Let me just say, for the interest of time, the proof of the theorem uses the chain Yao minimal hypersurface. Okay. So what does that technique say? It says it's kind of similar. This statement is kind of indicative of this kind of statement that you get from Shane Yao, which is you have a manifold of dimensions small enough so that kind of the analysis works out. If you have a positive scalar curvature metric and you take a hypersurface, which is stable minimal with respect to that metric. So what does that mean? It means it's a minimum of the area functional. So if you take that surface and you perturb it a little bit, you take a variation, the area increases. So it's a stable minimal height of the surface. It's a local minimum of the area functional if you perturb this surface. Okay, so just like minimal surfaces, you know, if you study soap films, minimal in that sense, that's what I mean by minimal here. So what they show is you, if you have a stable minimal hypersurface in a positive scalar curvature manifold, then that hypersurface also has positive scalar curvature. The restricted metric is conformal to a positive scalar curvature metric. So again, it's taking the problem of does my manifold emit positive scalar curvature and reducing the dimension by one to a different manifold? The problem is that when you do this, you don't necessarily have much control over what the hypersurface looks like. That could be very complicated, but it is a smooth, uh, orientable manifold closed. Okay. okay, so in this case, what do you do? You start with your M. So what, how do you produce this uh, stable minimal hypersurface? So in this dimension, if I just take a a homology class, a degree three homology class, you can always represent it by a stable minimal hypersurface. Okay, so this is using geometric measure theory results. So I can always find a stable minimal hypersurface. And what is the homology class here I'm taking? I'm taking a homology class, which is, so X is a mapping torus of N. So that means there's a map from X to S1. I'm taking a homology class to be one of the fibers of that map. Right, so that's a homology class here, but it also gives you a homology class here. Okay, so I'm taking a stable minimal hypersurface in this homology class. So N represents that homology class, but sigma may be very different to N. We can't assume that sigma is N, it's just some, some possibly disconnected uh, closed orientable three manifold, but it's in the same homology class as N. So the fact that it's in the same homology class, you might expect that I can map from this stable minimal hypersurface to N. Kind of, they're not necessarily equal, but there should be some natural map going from one to the other. And this kind of, you know, if you try and draw some pictures, you think, oh yeah, there should be a map, but it's not immediately clear that there is one. Um, so using kind of covering spaces and an argument about lifting these, uh, this stable minimal hypersurface to an appropriate covering, what we show is that this stable minimal hypersurface emits a map to the fiber N of non-zero degree, okay? And then it follows from this classification of positive scalar curvature closed orientable three manifolds that if you have a map of non-zero degree onto something which doesn't have positive scalar curvature, then you don't have positive scalar curvature. And then that, that shows the theorem. So this is really just an application of Shane Yao in this context. Okay, so that's what the theorem is proving. So why does this theorem help us in the case of non-Kähler properly elliptic? So we've seen why it helps in inner way. That's kind of clear because inner way surfaces are mapping tori, so it fits perfectly into the setup. But no, but elliptic surfaces aren't bundles. They're not mapping tori. They can have singular fibers. So surely that is going to obstruct us from using this theorem. So how do we do that? So let's talk about that. So let X be a non kähler uh, elliptic surface. So I'm not even assuming that it's properly elliptic yet. So this is just a non kähler elliptic surface. It's Kadar dimension could be minus infinity, zero or one. At some point, I want to tell you what the Kadar dimension tells us, but for the time being, I'm not assuming the Kadar dimension is anything. Okay, it's just elliptic and it's non kähler So there's a key difference for elliptic surfaces between the kähler and the non kähler case. 
So unlike in the Kayla case, non Kayla, let me say, yeah, non Kayla elliptic surfaces. Have no singular fibers. So this is a somewhat surprising fact. You normally think of non Kähler as like somewhat more complicated than complex, uh, than Kähler, sorry. But from the point of view of elliptic surfaces, actually, it has a huge restriction on what the fibers can be over these finitely many points, which aren't just normal uh, elliptic curves. They can't be singular. So there's only one thing really that they can be, which other than singular, is that they're multiple. So the way the proof goes of this fact is that if you had a singular fiber, that would imply that the first Betty number of your surface is even, somehow related to the first Betty number of the base curve that you map to. So that automatically implies the first Betty number is even, and hence Kähler. But we know that non-Kähler surfaces have to have odd Betty number. So it rules out these singular fibers. So we've greatly reduced what can go wrong in terms of the structure of these elliptic surfaces. So you can only have multiple fibers and technically with smooth reduction. So it's a multiple of a smooth fiber. Okay. Also, I should probably be saying relatively minimal at this point, but I'm being a bit kind of coarse as we're towards the end. Okay, so you can only have these multiple fibers of a smooth curve. So what you can do is you can think of this, like take a neighborhood of this multiple fiber. You can think of this as just taking a, a disc cross an elliptic curve and you've modded by, uh, out by an action of the disc, which is Z goes to Z to the K, which is a ramified covering with ramification index K at zero. So basically over zero, you have a problem, but everywhere else it's a smooth covering. So if you take these multiple fibers and you kind of take a covering, a degree K covering like this, what you essentially do is you unwind this multiple fiber and the multiplicity goes away in the cover. Okay, so what you can do is you can pass you can remove all multiple fibers. So by passing to a finite cover, we've removed these multiple fibers. So now we don't have any singular fibers, any multiple fibers. By passing to yet another finite cover, so you can assume that this is actually a principal elliptic bundle. Principal elliptic bundle. It's a holomorphic principal bundle with fiber and elliptic curves. Okay, so this gives rise. So principal elliptic bundle over a Riemann surface C. So this structure of an elliptic principal bundle gives you two circle bundles, just the two circles inside of the elliptic curve. Two circle bundles over C. Passing to another finite cover. You can make one of them trivial. So you have two circle bundles 
which kind of determine the principal elliptic bundle. By passing to a cover, you can make one of those circle bundles trivial. You can't make both of them because then it would be Kähler. But basically the point is that those circle bundles are classified by their first churn class in C. And you have one circle bundle which has a first churn class in C. You have another circle bundle whose first churn class is in C, but they live in H2 with integer coefficients of, of C, which is isomorphic to Z. So they're algebraically related. So because of this algebraic relation, you can kill one of them. But you can't kill both. So we obtain, let's call it X primed over X, finite covering with X primed equal to S1 cross N, where N is a non-trivial circle bundle over C. Okay, so N is what's left, so that's the non-trivial part, and then the trivial part gives us an S1. Okay, so now we see how this theorem may be of use because there we needed a X to be a mapping torus of N. Well, here this cover X primed is a mapping torus of N, it's just the mapping torus of the identity map, right? So now where does the properly elliptic come into it? So what we would need, remember, is that N, this fiber to, have, to not have positive scalar curvature, because then the whole four manifold would not have positive scalar curvature. So all I know now about N is that it's a circle bundle over a curve, right? So I know if, it's, if that curve is a torus or a surface of genus at least two, that's aspherical and hence this circle bundle is aspherical. But if it's a circle bundle over CP1, then that's not aspherical. It's either S3 or a quotient of S3. So the question now is, well, what is the base curve? Is it CP1 or is it higher genus? So this is where the Kadari convention comes in. So you can show that the Kadaira dimension of C is equal to the dimension of x and hence this cover x primed. Right. So if we had a non-Kähler elliptic surface of Kadaira dimension zero, then this curve C would have Kadaira dimension zero and hence be a C, uh, an elliptic curve. If the Kadaira dimension is one, then N is a non-trivial circle bundle over C, which has genus at least two. If you have Kadaira dimension minus infinity, then that's the case where C is CP1. So we're getting this cover is of the form S1 times a circle bundle over CP1. Circle bundle over CP1 is S3 mod a finite group. Right? That's exactly a, a secondary hop surface that I mentioned earlier. So if the Kadari dimension is minus infinity, what you're getting is elliptic hop surfaces. And there they do have positive scalar curvature. Right? So if the Kadari dimension is zero or one, this N is actually aspherical and that prevents positive scalar curvature. Okay, so that's where the Kadari dimension is very important here. Okay, so, so if the Kadari dimension is at least zero, then N is aspherical. So no PSC metrics. And hence, X primed has no PSC metrics. Likewise, P, uh, likewise, X by the theorem. Uh, and it also works for blow ups because of the P. some number of connected sum of CP2 bar. <clears throat> so this shows that non-Kähler elliptic surfaces of Kadari dimension zero or one, in particular properly elliptic surfaces, can't have positive scalar curvature. So they have Yamabi invariant less than or equal to zero, but because they're elliptic, they have Yamabi invariant 
greater than or equal to zero by LeBron. So combining those two, you get your Marbian variant zero. So this proof, this theorem kind of gives a unification. So it works not only for non kähler elliptic surfaces that we just discussed, it also works for inner wave surfaces because they're the, you still have a mapping torus, it's just not a trivial mapping torus. So somehow this theorem is kind of the structure of the diffeomorphism type of non kähler surfaces, if you allow yourself to pass to finite covers is actually not that complicated. Um, you obviously have the minimal ones and then you blow up, you know what happens under blow up. So you have hop surfaces, everything else is up to a cover, a mapping torus of a three manifold. And that three manifold is a circle bundle over a two torus, over a, either a two torus, CP1 or higher genus surface. That's assuming that the global spherical shell conjecture is true. So that's the, that's the big unknown part. If the global spherical shell conjecture is true, we understand the diffeomorphism types really well. If it's false, we have absolutely no idea. So that's a really interesting question. Um, so I think I'm out of time. So I think I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. And again, thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much, Michael, for the very great lecture. Is there any question? Uh, may I ask a simple question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, circle times torus does it admit any positive scalar curvature? No. So uh, no. Any torus of any dimension doesn't have positive scalar curvature by a theorem of Gromov and Lawson. Okay. So it's a circle times a torus is just a higher dimensional torus. Oh, oh, I see. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting subject. Is there more question? So it seems maybe it's a stupid question, but the Kodaira dimension has no role, right? Zero, one, you get the same. Yep. So in Kodaira dimension zero and one, you get your Marvin variant zero in both cases. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens in Kayla case and non Kayla case. Yes. So it's the same. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so somehow what this shows is that in a way surfaces are the only counterexample to the non kähler analog of LeBrun's theorem. I, I mean, see. with the caveat that global spherical shell is true. But if that's true, then basically in a way surfaces are kind of special. They're just the only counterexample. And kind of the reason being is that, you know, this theorem applies to them as well. Um, so yeah, okay. So, that's... so do, is there any other question? No? So th this is the last lecture of the course. So I want to thank again the, the organizer, in particular Mustafa Kalafa for thank you very much. Thanks for all the speakers. Nice uh, school. And thank you very thank much. You very much to all participants. That's you are welcome. <laughs> carefully <laughs> follow the lecture. Yeah. Yes. yeah, right. And it was nice. Thank you. Yeah, can, yeah we can stop the recording. I yes, I think it just. Uh, yeah, you're I, the only guy. You're the only guy can achieve it. it seems I, now. I, I don't know if I click here, maybe I stop um, the, the meeting or not. Let's see. Stop, stop recording first. Okay.